Hello everybody, this is Gustav Schick from Rostock University in Germany. Welcome to our online presentation. Oops, I have to share my screen and I have to close this. Okay, today, today I want to speak about growth and dissolution of crystal nuclei in poly lactic acid, and I would particularly focus on Taman's nuclei development method. The work I'm presenting is a collaborative work from the people at Kazan University, from Halle University in Germany, from Rostock University in Germany, and from Kharkov Institute of Physics and Technology in the Ukraine. So, um, Here you see the outline of my presentation. I will say a very few words about homogeneous crystal nucleation and polymers in general. I will shortly introduce Taman's two-stage nucleation and development scheme. And I will focus on the question, which nuclei are probed at the development stage within this scheme. And I will finalize my presentation. So, a few words about crystallization in general. You all know if, for example, sodium chloride crystallizes, the atoms are arranged on a three-dimensional lattice, and we have a very uniform and highly organized structure. If a polymer wants to do the same, there are some problems, and the main problem is that the ideal crystal of a polymer would consist of fully stretched chains, as you can see here. And in order to go from the coiled structure in the melt to the fully extended chain, we would have a dramatic loss of entropy. Because of that, the Gibbs or the change in the Gibbs free energy would be larger than zero. So this process normally does not happen only in very few exceptional cases. Nevertheless, most of the polymers we are surrounded by are in a semi-crystalline state. And the way around this entropic penalty is that the polymer chain is folding back and forth and it forms plate-like crystals, which have a thickness of typically 10 nanometer and which have a much wider lateral dimension. These crystal platelets are arranged in stacks, so-called lamella stacks, which can be arranged in much larger superstructures, for example, in spherulites. But similar to the sodium, crystal, sodium chloride crystal, also the polymer chain is arranged or on a three-dimensional lattice with a typical unit cell. And this, let's say, is accessible by X-ray scattering. The lamella uh, stack structure is also accessible by, uh, by small angle X-ray scattering or electron microscopy, etc. And spherulites, because of the size much larger than the wavelengths of the optical light are also accessible by optical microscopy, particularly this polarized light. So the way how the polymer goes from the uh, coiled conformation in the melt to this semi-crystalline lamella stack morphology is still under debate. And this is something I don't want to touch today, but I want to focus on the fact that each of these super molecular structures, as a spherulite, for example, needs a primary nucleus to grow. And this primary nucleus is commonly uh, just in the center of the spherulite. What do we know about nuclei? Nuclei are considered small particles of the newly developing phase, in this case, the crystal. And for monomeric liquids, 
again, we have the arrangement of a few atoms or molecules on a crystal lattice. And due to some competition between bulk and surface effects, there is a critical size of such aggregates, which are uh, indicating some limit for the stable situation. And that means if we are above a certain limit in the, regarding the size, such crystal nuclei may grow to real crystals. For polymers, the situation is actually very similar. Also here, we want to arrange some monomers on a regular crystal lattice. But as in the case of the crystallization in general, also here we have the limitation that our monomers are connected by covalent bonds. And that means we have a direct connection between the say, um, nucleus of the new phase and the surrounding liquid phase also in the, of the melt in our case. And this causes some additional difficulties and also some particular situations for the nucleation and polymeric liquids. Mutukuma illustrated this uh, very nicely based on some computer simulation. And he showed that even with also along one single polymer chain, there is a chance that there are several nuclei developing. And there is some, then some um, competition between the nuclei. And finally, a very few will survive. And maybe even less crystals will finally grow. But as you can see, one polymer chain may be even part of two different crystals. Good. And this primary nucleation stage, that is what we are interested in and what we want to study a little bit more in detail. Why we are interested in nucleation of polymers? This I would like to illustrate with a few um, arguments regarding the properties of semicrystalline polymers depending on the nucleation mechanism. Here you see a representation of the Crystallization time, let's say half time, is a function of temperature. Crystallization is very difficult close to the melting temperature because of the missing driving force. And crystallization becomes very difficult, as we need very long times, close to the glass transition temperature because of the reduced mobility. In between, we have a minimum in the time or a maximum in the crystallization rate. If we now cool a sample relatively slowly, let's say 10 Kelvin per minute, then because we have a logarithmic time scale, we see this curved trace here in our di diagram. And somewhere we will cross our crystallization line and our material will crystallize during the slow cooling. What we observe in an optical microscope are the typical spherolytic structures. And you see these are several objects. Each of them has a nucleus, which is a starting point for the growth of these larger objects. If you look on the length scale, you see this is something like 50 micrometers. So we have spherolites with a diameter of about 100 micrometer in this case. We can <clears throat> also have a look on much smaller length scale, let's say 50 nanometer by using an AFM. And you see the lamella structure of the crystalline structure in this AFM image. If we count the number of nuclei these conditions, we end up with something like 10 to the 4 nuclei per cubic millimeter. Now, if we succeed in bypassing the minimum of the crystallization time, the maximum of the crystallization rate by very fast cooling, and then allow the sample to stay here at constant temperature and develop towards this direction, 
then we will again cross the crystallization line and we will have formation of crystals. Now we can do the same imaging and you see in the optical micros micrograph with crossed polarizers, there's nothing to see. Even we are sure that we have formed crystals that we know from X-ray diffraction as well as from colorimetric experiments. So um, there must be something what is smaller and that is seen in the AFM image. You see there's a large number of small crystals and these are objects which have a size of about, 100, uh, about 10 nanometer. So again, each of these crystals needs its own nucleus to grow. And again, we can count the number of nuclei and we see it's 10 to the 15 per cubic millimeter. So 11 orders of magnitude larger number of nuclei in this case compared to the crystallization at the high temperature. And this has serious consequences for the properties of such a material. First of all, you see it's a problem of the optical properties. This is an opaque material, while the material with the very small crystals, all much smaller than the wavelength of the visible light. This is a transparent material. This is important, for example, for packaging, where you would like to have nicely transparent uh, foils, for example. Okay, but this is not the only difference. Also, if you look for the mechanical properties of these two types of materials, then you see that the spherolytic structures, they are very brittle. So the <coughs> strain at break is relatively small, particularly compared to the nodular structure which we have created by crystallization at very low temperature, where you see that we have a very ductile behavior. So the deformation at break is much, much larger. So you see that it's not only of academic interest to understand the nucleation behavior, but also for technical reasons. How to study crystal nucleation? Crystal nuclei are by definition very small and unstable objects. They are formed by fluctuations in the liquid phase. And that's why it's very hard to observe them directly. There are a few examples available in the literature, but this is very rare and also these are high resolution transmission electron microscopic um, images, and they do not allow to study the time development of the nuclei. That's why we need some other methods. And it was already Taman about 120 years ago, who proposed the following. He observed that the maximum of the nucleation rate, the nucleation rate is shown here in red, that the maximum of this curve is very often at significantly lower temperatures compared to the maximum of the growth rate of crystals, which is shown here in blue for glycerol. And his idea was to allow the system to nucleate. By the way, glycerol is a very slowly nucleating and crystallizing material. So he allows the system to form some new crystal nuclei here at around minus 60 degrees centigrade. Then he jumps to something like zero degree centigrade to allow these nuclei to grow to crystals, which he could observe in an optical microscope. This is a basic idea of this nucleation and growth uh, scheme proposed by Tamar. Here it is shown now as a function of undercooling. So we create nuclei at large undercooling, then we jump to a temperature which is higher, also at lower undercooling, and observe the growth of the crystals starting from the nuclei which we have formed here. 
Such experiments we can not only uh, perform by using microscopy, we can also identify the crystallization starting from existing nuclei by calorimetry. And the theme of such an experiment is illustrated here. It's a paper by Uguni, also already 24 years ago. And the idea is the following. Again, here is a function of undercooling. We have the nucleation rate or the typical time for nucleation. And here is the typical time for crystallization, for growth. And now if we use a constant nucleation time and we do it at a temperature where we do not cross this nucleation line, we will not create nuclei. If we choose a temperature where we cross a line, we will create some nuclei. The same for run number three and for run number four, we will again not create nuclei. If after this nucleation treatment, we quench our sample to low temperatures and perform a heating experiment relatively slow heating rate, let's say 10 Kelvin per minute, then you see the outcome here in this part of the slide. If there are no nuclei formed, as in run number one, then we see the glass transition and nothing else. If nuclei were formed, then as soon as we pass the temperature region where crystal grows as fast, we have a chance to grow crystals during the heating scan calorimeter. That results here in the cold crystallization peak and finally in the melting. The same for run number three. And for run number four, because there are no nuclei formed, we don't see anything else than the glass transition. This works quite well, and this is a basic idea we will follow later on. This was already um, discussed by Austin Angel in 1984, and he already mentioned at that time that it is important to cross the temperature of the maximum um, growth rate or nucleation rate at a rate which is so fast that there is no significant nucleation in the sample. And at that time, he thought that the perkin elmer dsc 4 a power compensated differential scanning calorimeter, is a very well suited instrument. Today, we know that for most of the materials, the cooling rates which are available with this type of experiment, which is of the order of 100 Kelvin per minute, is much too slow to avoid nucleation on cooling. So we need much faster calorimeters, and that is what is available nowadays with the fast scanning chip calorimeters. The basic idea is illustrated here in the schematic drawing. We have a silicon frame, the gray part, and we have a freestanding silicon nitride membrane on top of the frame. And in the center of the freestanding membrane, we have heaters and thermometers or the thermopile. And if we place the sample directly on this heated area, we can use such a device as a calorimeter. Here you see photographs of the real device. On a transistor housing, you see the silicon frame, the black part and the freestanding membrane. Here you see the same a little bit enlarged. Now the frame is green. Here the freestanding membrane and in the very center of the membrane is a heater and the thermometer, which is shown here in even more detail. The two thick lines are the resistive heater made from doped silicon. And here you have thick thermocouples which form a thermopile, again made from P and N doped silicon. The cold junction of the thermopile is here on the frame. So what we measure is the temperature increase relative to the temperature of the frame. 
And here you see a typical polymers sample on such a sensor. This is a sample of about 20 nanogram, and that gives you also an idea about the sample mass we are using. So, how to study homogeneous nucleation kinetics? As I told you, we follow Taman's two stage experiment. We have a nucleation stage and we have a growth stage. And in between, we have some cooling and heating, and again, cooling. And at the very end, we have an analysis heating scan. And the idea is the following. Here at the annealing, at the lower temperature, we form nuclei. And in case that this temperature is below the glass transition temperature, then we will also have some entropy relaxation. This we can see in the heating scanner one, which is shown here. And you see the typical um, peak on top of the glass transition due to enthalpy relaxation. Then after the growth stage, so when we allow existing nuclei to grow to crystals, we quench again, and then we do a heating scan to, studying the, to study the melting of the formed crystals. Here you see, even without additional nucleation, there's a small melting peak. This is due to the fact that we always have some heterogeneities in the material, and there are some crystals growing from this heterogeneities, which act as a heterogeneous nucleating agent. But as you can see, if we enlarge the time we spend at the nucleation stage, we see a drastic increasing melting peak, indicating an increase in the crystallization enthalpy here during the growth stage. And this tells us that we are really forming nuclei during our nucleation stage. This we can quantify by integrating the peaks. The first is from the heating scan one, the enthalpy relaxation. You see the typical sigmoidal increase and then it saturates when we reach the enthalpy of the extrapolated liquid state. And if we look for the enthalpy of crystallization, we see that just when we reach the end of the enthalpy relaxation, then we have the start of the crystal nucleation and an increase in the crystallization enthalpy. And we can evaluate the half time of the crystallization to understand the kinetics of the nucleation process. So if we do such an experiment, there is a question which was actually already uh, asked by Taman 100 years ago which nuclei are really probed at the development temperature. This is simply due to the fact that during the nucleation stage, we will form a very broad distribution of nuclei of different size. And growth to crystal is only possible for nuclei which have the critical size for nuclei at the development temperature. That means at the higher temperature. Now we can think about two types of experiments. One is if we heat infinitely fast, that means there is no time for growth or stabilization of existing nuclei, nor can we form new nuclei on, the, on heating from the nucleation stage to the crystal or development stage. All clusters which have radi, radi, which are smaller than the critical radius at the development temperature, will disappear or dissolve on the transfer to the development temperature because they are simply not stable at this temperature. So, and what can grow to crystals are only the clusters which fulfill this condition or have larger uh, dimensions. If we think about an experiment where we heat our sample slowly from the 
nucleation to the development temperature. Then clusters which have a size which is smaller than the critical size at the development temperature may grow to the necessary size. And finally, nucleate crystal grows at the development temperature. Or if we heat really slowly, this may already happen during the transfer. So how can we distinguish between these two cases? Obviously, by varying the heating rate, then we heat from the nucleation stage to the development stage. And obviously, the first case is a more interesting one because here we know more or less exactly what we are studying. We see only the clusters which have sizes larger than the critical, or at least the size of the critical class at the development temperature. So and this is what we want to do. And if we look around in the literature, we recognize that there is not too much information available about such kind of experiments. There are some papers where people studied the influence of the development temperature on the results, particularly Fokin from St. Petersburg did a large number of studies on silica glasses. And due to some, let's say, experimental limitations, uh, such studies are basically limited to very slow crystallizing um, materials. The influence of the heating rate is much less studied. There is one modeling work in the framework of the classical nucleation theory where Davis in 2001 uh, already asked the question, what happens if we change the heating rate? And there is a first experiment by Shuravlyov and Schmelzer in 2015 from the Rostock group, where we used a quite wide range of transfer heating rates. But unfortunately, at that time, we had a badly chosen material. Uh, it was much too fast crystallizing. And then there was another paper by Deubner in 2017, but the heating rate range was very limited. And so the conclusions were not too much. So our approach today is, using fast scanning calorimetry in combination with a slowly nucleating and slowly crystallizing material. And the material of choice is in this case polylactic acid, which is crystallizing relatively slow and can be easily studied by fast scanning calorimetry. So here you see the idea of the experiment. We start at a temperature in the melt, so we erase all thermal history. Then we quench at, let's say, 1,000 Kelvin per second, which is much faster than needed to prevent nucleation on cooling. Then we have an annealing stage for nucleation. In our case, we focus on 60 degrees centigrade, and we vary the time for nucleation, and we vary the heating rate when we go from the nucleation stage to the growth stage. And the growth stage is fixed to 125 degrees centigrade and 70 seconds. That means we are allowing the crystals to grow a little bit, but not too much, as I will show you in a minute. Then we quench down to room temperature again. This allows us to do some optical microscopy and some AFM studies with a particular combination of AFM and fast scanning calorimetry. And after that, we are doing the analysis heating scan to see how many crystals were formed at the growth stage. Here you see a typical result. This is for the nucleation at 60 degrees centigrade for 800 seconds and this particular development conditions. And now you see the curves for different atmosphere heating rates. And you see in this materials, if we heat very, uh, if we do not nucleate, there's nothing. 
And if we nucleate for the given conditions here, we see there's a heating, uh, there's a melting peak. And for the slowest heating rate, this is a very large melting peak. And with increasing heating rate, this peak decreasing and finally reach some kind of saturation here at the end. Again, we can quantify this by integrating the melting peak. And now you see for the nucleation at 60 degrees centigrade, what we get. If we do not nucleate the sample at all, the black squares, then you see at very slow heating, everything happens on heating. So there is actually no difference what we are doing before with our sample. And then if we increase the heating rate, immediately there's no nucleation and crystallization during heating, and we reach a value close to zero, let's say at rates a little bit above 100 Kelvin per second. Now, if we anneal longer, you see this decrease shifts to higher heating rates. And for 500 second annealing, you see we have, we need already something like a few thousand Kelvin per second to reach the near to zero level. And for 800 second, you see even at the highest heating rates, there is still some crystallization. That means here we have a situation that there are some nuclei surviving the heating process, even at the highest heating rates. Now, if we nucleate for longer times, you see we increase the crystallization enthalpy. In other words, since the growth conditions are always the same, also each nuclei grows for the same time under the same condition, in other words, we increase the number of growing crystals. And you see that continues at 2,500 seconds and even at 10,000 seconds, we have another increase in the number of nuclei growing to crystals at the development stage. Let's focus on the heating rate of 10,000 Kelvin per second. That is already here in this plateau. And this tells us something about the nuclei, which have already the critical size at the development temperature reached at the nucleation stage. So, and 10,000 Kelvin per second is high enough. You see the critical cooling, uh, heating rate, sorry, uh, for preventing stabilization of the nuclei on heating is something like two, 3,000 Kelvin per second. So with 10,000 Kelvin per second, we are fast enough. And we can plot the crystallization enthalpy as a function of the nucleation time. And we observe a curve here, black. And we can think about what would we expect to see. From the classical nucleation theory, we know that at the beginning of the nucleation stage, there is some transient state where we start to form some nuclei. And as I told you already, nucleation is a stochastic process, so nuclei appear, disappear, and so on. And it takes some while until we have a steady state nucleation. And the steady state nucleation should result in such a linear increase of the number of nuclei with time. So, and this beginning, also the change from something like a transient nucleation to a steady state nucleation, we can probably see, but very early, we already see a serious deviation from the steady state behavior. So we would expect that this curve continues along the red line. So what's the reason for this? Let's have a look on the predictions from the nucleation theory. And for the PLLA and the 
development temperature of 125 degrees centigrade. We expect the number of over critical clusters. This is a blue curve here, as indicated here. And you see the time needed for this induction time is something like 700 seconds. And already after, let's say, uh, 1,300 seconds or so, we would reach a number of nuclei of 5 times 10 to the 24 per cubic meter. What does it mean, such a number? This, also 10 to the 24 per cubic meter means that we have a distance between neighboring nuclei of about 10 nanometer. This is approximately what we have seen for the nodular structure in the AFM images. So you see, after let's say 1,000, 1,300 seconds, we have already a very large number of nuclei, and there's basically no space for growth. So these many nuclei can grow only a very little. And as soon as they touch each other, we have impingement and then there is no further growth or very limited further growth. And this is probably what we observe in our curves. So we have the steady state nucleation and then if the number becomes too large, then we have a space problem and for the given development time, the nuclei cannot grow undisturbed, and that's why we see this deviation from the red line. If we look on the optical images we have collected for these samples, then there's an interesting observation. You see here for 800 seconds or 1,000 seconds, where from the calorimetric data we see already a large number of nuclei, there's basically nothing seen here for for the optical micrographs. But after two and a half thousand seconds and longer, we see dramatic changes. And this is exactly what we have seen as the time where we see the deviation from the red line. So we have also tried to, uh, to look in a little bit more detail on the structure of these samples with an AFM. And you see here AFM images taken after uh, the development stage. And you see here in this image, for example, small crystals which have a size of about 100 nanometer. And obviously, as soon as we reach a nuclear density where the distance between nuclei is only 10 nanometer, there is not enough space to grow crystals of 100 nanometer. Okay, what we see is after 100 second nucleation, there's nothing that's shorter than the induction time. Then we see in the transient state the occurrence of first nuclei, the number of nuclei increases. And already after 800 second, we see that it, it's hard to distinguish the separate nuclei, even they are more or less separate. But after 1,000 seconds, you see the image changes totally. And we have some co-continuous morphology here, indicating that the growing crystals are somehow merging and that we have some kind of coalescence here in the sample, which finally results in the birefringent structure, which we see in the optical micrographs. OK, so this seems to be understood. And to check if our explanation is correct, we thought, okay, if it is a space problem for the growing nuclei, then if we reduce the growth time, also we still use the same growth temperature, but we reduce the growth time, then we should be able to follow this linear increase for longer nucleation times. And you see while here for the black curve for the 70 second, we already have deviation after 700 or 800 seconds. 
For the green curve for 35 seconds, we can follow the linear increase up to 2000 seconds. And for the much shorter times, you see it's hard to see any deviation from the linear behavior. There's another interesting observation in this graph. You see all these red curves, they intersect with zero here at the same time of about 600 seconds which is induction time and which is in very good uh, agreement with the prediction from the nucleation theory. So, okay, this is the experiment itself. So we are able to follow steady state nucleation for a limited time, but we are able to follow. And this allows us to study the nucleation kinetics. But we were also interested in the question how stable are the nuclei? Or in other words, what is the size distribution of the nuclei? And for that, the temperature profile was designed as shown here. Again, quenching from a temperature above the melting temperature. Now a fixed nuclei formation for 1000 seconds at 60 degrees centigrade then heating at variable heating rate to a temperature which is higher than the development temperature and which we vary. And then we have again the development stage with fixed conditions and we look on the number of crystals formed here by analyzing the melting enthalpy from the analysis heating scan. Here you see the result. For different temperatures of the spike, as this maximum temperature is varied, we see that for a spike which goes only 5 Kelvin above the development temperature, there is not much change. We see again the slight decrease with increasing heating rate. And you see the stars, these are the data without a spike at all. So basically not much happened. But as soon as we go five Kelvin higher, you see the plateau value here at the highest heating rates decreases. And already at 145 degrees centigrade, that is 20 Kelvin above the development temperature, there is no crystallization at all only at the very low transfer heating rates when we stabilize everything during the transfer. But as we have learned from the previous experiment, we have to be faster than 1000 Kelvin per second to have the condition of infinite fast heating. And this tells us now something about the size distribution of the clusters. And what we expect to see is here shown from a theoretical calculation based on classical nucleation theory. You see the development of the cluster size distribution with time. Here you see the different nucleation times. And here the distribution function. And here the cluster size in the number of units in the cluster. Okay, and you see for our case, here, let's say the curve at about 500 seconds will be tested. And what is interesting, these curves are quite steep at the end. So we are approaching very fast, very low numbers. Okay, it's a logarithmic scale here. So we plot the crystallization enthalpy as a function of the uh, spike temperature. And you see for no spike, everything is constant. And then we see the dramatic decrease from four times 10 to the 24 nuclei per cubic meter to zero within, let's say, about 20 Kelvin. And According to the uh, classical nucleation theory, we can estimate the radius of a critical cluster for the different 
temperatures of the spike. And you see that we start at about 1.6 nanometer and we end here at about two nanometers. So you see the variation is not too much. Also, I have to say the calculation based on the classical nucleation theory, these are very rough estimates and I don't want to, to say this is 1.6, it could be 0.6 or it could be 2.6, but this doesn't matter. So we see that within a relatively small change of the cluster size, we lose all, let's say, existing clusters. So we have this dramatic decrease of the surviving clusters. With this, we have an idea about cluster sizes, actually the number of clusters available of a certain size. You see here, also 1.9 or so, we have still 10 to the 24 cluster per cubic meter, but we have much more for the smaller ones. With this, I'm at the end of the experimental part and I would like to summarize what we have seen. So first of all, we have shown that the nucleation and also the growth kinetics uh, of the nuclei can be accessed by fast scanning colorimetry. The number of surviving nuclei strongly depends on the transfer heating rate, as that's a quantity one cannot neglect. One has to make sure that one is fast enough so that nuclei cannot stabilize on the way between the nucleation and the gross temperature. And it strongly depends on the maximum temperature before we go to the development temperature. And what is also interesting and not obvious, the classical nucleation theory, which is basically made for atoms, also describes the observation for the polymer PLLA reasonably well. So by choosing the right parameters, we have a very nice description of our experimental findings. If you are interested in this topic, I can only point to three recent publications dealing with the subject. There is one by Andriano, um, which is just about these experiments. There's another one uh, discussing a, a combination with infrared spectroscopy, an idea which was born in Kazan, but finally realized at uh, Leipzig University, and another uh, paper where we combined atomic force microscopy with fast scanning chip colorimetry. And with this, I'm at the end. And I have to acknowledge a very helpful discussion, discussions with Alexander Minakov from the General Physics Institute in Moscow. And uh, we have to acknowledge a grant from the Ministry of Education and Science of the Russian Federation within the mega grant uh, program and functional materials, Rostock EV, which also supplies such kind of colorimeters. And I thank you for your attention. And as you see, there's always some light at the horizon. Thank you very much.